12 horas eh, en Argentina, estamos ahí pleno mediodía, eh, GMT-3, eh, pero sabemos que nos están bien decidiendo de muchos lugares eh, distintos eh, a la vez, eh, así que eh, ahí ya, ya casi estamos, eh, me parece, porque ya tenemos a, a dos de nuestros eh, panelistas ahora en escasos segundos los vamos a estar sumando, we'll be adding them, because this one will be conducted in English, Uh, as soon as we have, okay, there we go. We have Jaron Brook here. We have Johan Norberg. So pleased to have you here with us. Uh, I was speaking a little bit in Spanish, as you know, uh, most of the audience probably following us in Spanish right now. But uh, uh, I'll, I'll keep switching. We, we are just waiting for two of our other panelists to join here. We are waiting for Dieter McCluskey and for Axel Kaiser, who I'm sure, I'm sure, are about to join. Uh, as I was saying, we're going to have uh, the laberinto se sale por arriba, la innovación como herramienta del progreso y el bienestar. In, in English, we title it a little bit easier. It's innovation as a tool for progress and prosperity. It doesn't have the labyrinth in the image, but it, it can be quite understood. I guess that we should be starting just to be respectful and mindful of the people that are already connected. We'll have McCloskey and Axel as soon as they connect. Uh, we have Yaron Brook, he's chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, host of the Yaron Brook show, always live on YouTube. He has authored many books, but uh, maybe ones that we can mention, Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. Also, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. And In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance, uh, together with uh, Don Watkins. Uh, he has an MBA and a PhD of the University of Texas at Austin. We already have Johan Norber with us here today. He has author so many books that it is quite hard to list them all. You probably have all read In Defense of Global Capitalism, one of his main bestsellers, translated to a multitude of languages. I guess it's over 20 already, maybe even 25 or 30 languages in which you can read In Defense of Global Capitalism. Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. Uh, you have now his newest and latest book, Open, The Story of Human Progress, a title that I love and that I like. Johan Norberg is also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and he writes on globalization, entrepreneurship, individual liberty. Um, he, he has been diffusing and promoting the ideas of liberty throughout the whole world. We have Deirdre McCloskey joining us here today. She's already connected. You can see her there on the screen. Uh, I'm just doing the short presentations. I love uh, just presenting Deirdre, our dear professoress, our dear profesora in Spanish. She's distinguished professor emerita of economics and of history and professor emerita of English and of communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Trained at Harvard in the 1960s as an economist, she has written 20 books and some 400 academic articles on economic theory, economic history, philosophy, rhetoric, the statistical theory, feminism, ethics, and law. She taught for 12 years at the University of Chicago in the economics department in its glory days, days as she says, but now describes herself, and this is, the, the, I love uh, reading this quote, I, I just love it, uh, and she keeps changing it and updating it. She describes herself as a literary, quantitative, postmodern, free market, progressive, Episcopalian, ex-Marxist, Midwestern woman from Boston who was once a man, not conservative, I'm a Christian classical liberal. That's the updated quote we get on Deirdre and the presentation. Uh, Axel Kaiser is, I think Axel Kaiser is joining there. There we have Axel Kaiser here on screen as well. Uh, Axel, I was doing the presentations in English. We can do them in English with you, in Spanish, I guess in German. You speak so many languages. You are a globe trotter. Mm -hmm. You'll decide in which language you want to present when it's uh, your <laughs> turn. Uh, so you have uh, Axel Kaiser. He has written many, many books. I'm going to say titles in Spanish, although we could say them in English as well. Uh, El Chile que se viene, La fatal ignorancia, La miseria del intervencionismo, La tiranía de la igualdad, junto a Gloria Álvarez, El engaño populista, El papa y el capitalismo, y su libro más reciente, La neo-inquisición. Eh, tiene su podcast, Mental Morphos, 
pronounces, uh, and how I pronounce it in English and correctly, the, 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 the pun and the game there on the word. Uh, Presidente del directorio de la Fundación para el Progreso, Senior Fellow, abogado, eh, doctor por la Universidad de Heidelberg en Alemania. Tenemos realmente un panel eh, absolutamente genial. So I'm going to, to say the rest. We only... Uh, eight, five minutes of the time that we have. Uh, it's going to be five minutes each, uh, which will amount to about an hour. Uh, you'll go in turns, I'll do this alphabetically. And then if we have time, we'll try to tackle some questions, maybe some questions from, from the audience. We'll start with Yaron Brook, then we'll go with Axel Kaiser, then Deirdre McCluskey, and then Johan Norberg. That's in alphabetic order. So, uh, so pleased to have you all here with us, uh, Yaron. It's your turn. It's your 15 minutes. So pleased to listen to you and to pay attention to what you have to share with us today. Thank you, uh, Garrett. Thank you uh, for inviting me on this uh, prestigious panel. Um, the title, The Innovation is the Source of uh, Economic Progress. And of course, that's exactly what the source of economic progress ultimately is. It is the entrepreneur. It is the entrepreneur applying his mind to solving problems in the world out there. Uh, it is the entrepreneur not only coming up with ideas, but actually executing on those ideas, taking those ideas and making them a reality, making them a reality. In other words, making them, turning them into a value, a value for other people, a value that other people uh, are willing to invest in, are willing to buy into. Uh, and that, Activity. That activity is what generates, ultimately generates jobs. It generates uh, economic production. Uh, it generates consumption. Ultimately, it is the source of, uh, of growth and prosperity that the world see. Sadly, we take this idea of innovation and economic growth for granted. Um, but we do so... Uh, We do so and we take great risk by doing so, uh, for it is, it, it is the engine that drives, uh, that drives our future. If, if we look at, at the importance of economic growth, uh, I mean, it's, it's weird going before Deirdre because you, 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 know, you expect to have Deirdre set up the context of the great enrichment and then we all, we all riff on that. Um, and, and I assume she's going to do that. But if we look into the future, if you, if you take economic growth, for example, uh, and if you assume that the economy is going to grow at 2% a year for the next 40 years. Uh, then and you see, if you assume low income, let's say a $20,000 $20, a year income grows at about the same as the rate of economic growth, of real economic growth, then that $20,000 will turn into, in terms of real terms, will turn into $40-something thousand dollars over the next 40 years. Um, I mean, that's nice. Everybody's doubly better off, the double Um, uh, it, you know, and, and suddenly uh, for, for a family, it's making $20,000 a year, $40,000 a year is a big improvement. But if, on the other hand, you assume that economic growth is now growing at 5% a year, that is seven times. That means that $20,000 a year income now is $140,000 a year. Now there's no poverty. <laughs> there's no issue of poverty. If everybody, if, they, if the lowest income out there is making $140,000 a year, then um, inequality will still exist, but poverty will not. And uh, you've solved many of the problems that people complain about constantly. Economic growth solves those problems, gets rid of those problems if it's robust. And of course, a 5% economic growth is, uh, I believe, more than possible in the world in which we live. So the question really is, I think the question is for every country in the world today, What does it take? What does it take to generate that economic growth? Or in the context of what we're talking about today, what does it take to get people to innovate, to, 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 to get entrepreneurs, to get innovation, to uh, get new technologies to, and that ultimately grow the economy? What is it? What are the components that innovation requires? Well, if we look at At, at places where innovation happens, uh, let's take Silicon Valley today. What is, what is interesting about Silicon Valley? What makes Silicon Valley uh, tick, right? Why is innovation so robust in a place like Silicon Valley? Well, uh, Silicon Valley is a place, it's a culture that, ex that, that celebrates 
it celebrates risk taking. It celebrates failure, failure from which people can learn, not failure for the sake of failure, but failure as a mechanism by which we learn, grow, improve, explore. It celebrates exploration, trial and error. It celebrates science and technology. It celebrates the mind and applying the ideas of the mind in reality freely. It celebrates thinking out of the box and not having limitations on our thinking and our ability to execute on those thoughts. So if we look at Silicon Valley, it has a particular kind of culture, a particular kind of set of ideas that drive it, that involve this idea of exploration and trial and error, failure, risk-taking. Silicon Valley is also a place that, to use uh, Johann Noberg's terminology, is a very open place. <laughs> it's a place that celebrates immigrants, that uh, where half the startups, right, half the startups in Silicon Valley have one immigrant, at least one immigrant founder. It's a celebrate. It's a it's a place that celebrates connection, not just immigrants working in the valley, but the ability to to cooperate across countries internationally on a global scale. Uh, it's a place where color, it, that encourages collaboration, uh, communication, connection across uh, an entire, the entire globe. I mean, we, we have today, uh, you know, we have today a, a, um, a, a world connected like it's never been before, like it's never been in the history of mankind. Uh, a, a world where we can instantly communicate with everybody. I'm, I'm right now uh, in Lisbon. I think uh, Johan is in Sweden, maybe in Washington. Who knows where Johan is? Uh, Deirdre might be at home in Chicago. Axel might be in Chile. You're in Argentina. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And we can do this like that. Um, but a culture that celebrates this, that, that embraces it, that embraces the fact that we can, we can in a sense, leverage 7 billion minds for the sake of solving problems in the world is a culture that is going to celebrate and embrace innovation and growth. And lastly, of course, one needs the freedom to explore. One needs the freedom to connect. One needs the freedom to engage in uh, thinking outside the box and then acting on one's ideas. Uh, we need we need a, a political system that's relatively free. And, and again, if you look at Silicon Valley, one of the advantages Silicon Valley has had over the last 40 years, an advantage that I fear is probably going away soon, sadly, is that it has been relatively unregulated, that it has been left alone, that they don't have controls. You know, it's amazing that almost every profession in America today requires a government license in order to practice it. Almost everything, you know, doing nails and, and braiding hair and, and uh, but, but the one profession that probably affects our world more than any other uh, that, that is responsible for uh, airplanes flying in the sky to the running of our electric utilities to the fact that we can communicate right now. And that is programming. Isn't it amazing that the bureaucrats have not gotten around to licensing programmers? Uh, Amazon and Google and Apple hire whoever they want. Or, you know, you can have a college degree or not. You can, you can train yourself or you can train in some boot camp for programming. And yet, I don't want to give anybody ideas, but yet the government has not gotten its hands on, on, on licensing and regulating programming. And yet programming is behind, uh, software is behind almost every activity we engage in in the modern world. So that freedom, the fact that there's no licensing, the fact that companies are free to hire whoever they want, the, the, the fact that there's no review board, I don't know, the equivalent of an FDA for, for uh, uh, software programs, uh, right? Imagine that you had to submit your software program to a government bureaucracy that approved it or not, as we do with uh, drugs, vaccines, uh, and other things, uh, has allowed for massive exploration is allowed for the creation of products and none of us would have imagined five, 10, certainly 20, 30, 40 years ago. So at the end of the day, it is freedom that, uh, that, that makes possible, makes possible 
this, uh, the, the innovation and, and as a consequence, uh, economic growth. And again, it, uh, freedom depends on a particular set of ideas and a particular culture. Freedom depends on a, on a culture that respects, I think, fundamentally two values. Uh, two values that, that the Enlightenment respected and, and, and I think as a consequence, we saw the, 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 great, the great economic progress, the great innovation. It's not an accident that what we got, and again, as Deirdre has written extensively on, it's not an accident that we got what we got in the 19th century. It was set up by a cultural shift before that. I'll focus on two values. Uh, uh, you know, the two values that I think are the most meaningful in coming out of the um, the Enlightenment, and those are the, the 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 idea of reason, the idea of reason as man's means of knowledge, the idea that everybody has reason, that all of us are capable of taking care of ourselves, of thinking for ourselves, of of uh, innovating, discovering uh, science, technology, engineering, or not professions for some elite, unique group of people. Almost everybody in the 18th century or many people in the 18th century became enamored with Newton's laws and then the new science that was coming about and they couldn't understand it. They could actually figure it out. It wasn't something that you needed some kind of superpower or to be a, uh, a philosopher king in, in, in Plato's terminology. It was something that the common man could understand. And therefore, if they could understand that, couldn't they apply their reason to what profession they chose? Couldn't they apply their reason to who to marry, to, uh, to who their political leaders should be, and uh, to starting their own companies without permission and without, uh, without asking for permission? So that idea that we each have a mind is a crucial idea that the Enlightenment brings back after it had, you know, it, it had been dormant for a very long time. Uh, that idea of, of all of us having the capacity to reason also leads us to uh, the value of the individual. The individual can take care of himself. So these two ideas, reason and individualism, the individual as an end in himself, as a moral end in himself, the idea uh, of, of uh, the pursuit of happiness, I think is crucial to this. It is that kind of culture that produces freedom. And is that freedom then incentivize and leaves alone the great innovators to make, to produce, to build, to create, and to give us the kind of progress that, uh, that has benefited us so much and can benefit us so much uh, in the future. So uh, much of what I think needs to be done to create this world of innovation and progress is education. It's about teaching the values and teach it and changing the culture in ways that support innovation, progress, and freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaron, and thank you very much for being so on time. That was also perfect, not just the allocution of what you said about the timing. Uh, we'll go now with Axel Kaiser. Vamos a ir con Axel Kaiser. We're going alphabetically. Estamos yendo en orden alfabético. Axel, es un gusto tenerte con nosotros. Eh, imagino que lo harás en español, pero podrías hablar en cualquier idioma que quisieras. Eh, seguramente un placer tenerte acá en el Congreso de Liberalismo Cultural. No, thank you very much for the invitation. I will do it in English because um, we have a distinguished panel and I don't want them to miss my presentation. Although I've learned uh, a lot uh, from them, it's very nice to see you again, Johan and Didri, of course. It's always a great pleasure and Yaron as well. And um, I think we will agree on many, many issues here. You know, growing up in Chile, being a member of a German family and always uh, going to Germany and seeing the contrast, the difference between, um, you know, developed society and a developing society, I was always wondering how was it possible that uh, Germany was uh, so much more advanced than it was Chile, let's say, in the early 90s. And, um, and this is a question that until today, it's uh, really one of my obsessions. Uh, take a look at Switzerland, for example. My younger brother lives in Switzerland right now. Switzerland is like a village in the middle of the Alps. It's nothing really special. I mean, it's beautiful, but it has no natural resources. It's not really a big country. It has 
roughly, I don't know, 8 million people, uh, inhabitants. And yet, uh, Switzerland is the most innovative country in the world if we believe the Global Innovation Index uh, among 132 countries. And it has 20 Nobel laureates in science. And we in Latin America have uh, huge extensions of lands. We have natural resources, like there is no end for them. It's unlimited almost. Uh, we have, um, uh, you know, 700 million people almost. And we have uh, three, four Nobel laureates in uh, hard sciences. And we are not in the rankings of the Global Innovation Index, basically. We don't exist. And so that deserves uh, an explanation. And it cannot be the fact that Swiss people or, uh, or Swedes or Danes or Germans or French or people in the United States or in Korea, because all of these are in the, among the top 10 countries in the Global Innovation Index. Uh, it cannot be the case that they are somehow uh, genetically better and so they are smarter and more creative. And that's the reason why they are, you know, creating all these uh, technologies and all this um, progress. Uh, because we have plenty of also European descendants here in Latin America. I mean, that, that cannot be the explanation. So um, I will try to uh, attempt a different explanation. And Jarl already, you know, talked about, uh, about this. Um, and I believe the main problem in, in Latin America and other countries, maybe, is that we are still pretty much uh in the framework of the pre-modern envious societies and here i'm 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 basing my argument on the uh, excellent work by helmut schuck on envy as a theory of social behavior where he argues that envious societies are really an obstacle for every kind of progress and also uh, for civilization itself uh, when it's, of course, an extreme form of institutionalized envy uh, and for innovation. He says that literally. Uh, and so envy uh, becomes a theory of social behavior because he, he says it's much more universal than people think. It's not something that you go you treat with your psychologist, like if you had some other type of uh, personality disorder or something like that. It's a social force. We compare ourselves all the time with other people. And it's, it's, it's partly also part of human nature to feel envious. Uh, and, and here, the answer for correcting that is, of course, culture. You can have culture with storytelling uh, or with stories or myths or um, religions or whatever that are very effective at um, civilizing this instinct this passion, which John Stuart Mill said is the most antisocial and evil of all passions, is envy. And he was right. And you can have other cultures where, uh, and also Shakes, um, uh, you know, offers some examples of this. Envy is basically the general rule, and which are very primitive societies. There are societies, for instance, like uh, some tribes, like the Navajos, they didn't even have, have uh, the concept of chance or luck. Everything happened because someone else was evil and did something to you. Or if you were successful, they had no notion of person, personal merit or success. It was because you robbed someone else. Uh, or you did something like, you know, evil eye or some sort of magic or whatever in order to be better off. A and so envy has this paralyzing effect on people because you, of course, fear um, if you live in a community that's very envious that they will retaliate somehow and they will end up, you know, um, punishing you or confiscating your property or even uh, burning you like it happened to many people accused of uh, witchcraft. We had as a driving, uh, you know, motive the uh, envy, envy, basically, um, successful People, beautiful people, uh, were accused of being witches and would be killed uh, at some point in history. And so uh, I believe strongly egalitarian narratives like, like the ones that prevail in Latin America uh, and um, 
are reinforced by the discourse of some sectors of the Catholic Church, which is very influential in our region, like Pope Francis, for example, um, have a lot to do with envy. This is also one of, of Schuch's arguments. And that explains, in my opinion, why uh, the intellectual hegemony in Latin America uh, is uh, on the side of egalitarianism. And no, I'm not speaking about a Scottish Enlightenment type of egalitarianism, like Didri explained to us. Um, this was the key to prosperity. I'm speaking about the uh, material type of factual egalitarianism, more the socialist kind of egalitarianism. And, and this is the common sense uh, in Latin America, even though we have made progress on different uh, fields, other countries have completely destroyed themselves, like Venezuela, for instance. And now the freest country in Latin America, which, which is Chile, uh, well, we are not be doing very well. We are going back to this primitive type of thinking, uh, arguing um, that, you know, the success of the few, which is not true because Everyone has experienced prosperity in Chile in the last 30 years, but there are rich people and they are evil and we have to attack them and the uh, institutions that enable them to be successful, they have to be transformed in order to become more um, egalitarian. And in the last ranking of economic freedom, we dropped 14 places from one year to the next. So, um, and, and here is again what, what Bjorn was saying. Uh, there is a strong correlation if you take a look at the uh, freedom of the world index and innovation in the innovation index so um, you need on the one hand this i mean you need this culture of uh, uh, individualism that is uh, the opposite of an envious culture where tribalism or some sort of collect of collectivism and enforced confirmation uh, uh, conformation to the norm to the norm is the rule you need uh, individualism and you need of course uh, institutions you need economic freedom if you don't have economic freedom how are you going to spread innovation i mean you can have an invention a new technology but you, if you don't have strong protection of property uh, rights if you don't have open markets if you don't have that how are you going to make this new technology technology useful for everyone it's, it's very hard so, and so that explains, in my opinion, two things. One, why most people in Latin America who are smart, well qualified, and, and also uh, hardworking, not necessarily with, with degrees, you know, from good universities, they leave our continent, our region. They go to uh, the United States, they go to Europe, mostly to the United States. It's, it's all sort of, of people going there. It's not what, you know, television shows you people arriving you know, uh, at the frontier with uh, with the United States in Mexico there. No, those are people desperate because, you know, we don't have the institutions and we don't have the necessary culture or the uh, required culture to uh, create prosperity. But then you also have a very qualified people who, uh, you know, go there with, uh, you know, skills and then they become very successful as well. So they leave these uh, countries uh, not because we, we lack natural resources or we lack good people are for sure very good people in this region as well. It's not like everyone uh, is trying to make your life impossible, uh, but we lack the institutions, the economic freedom. And above all, I, th I believe we lack the culture of freedom, individualism. Actually, there is a ranking uh, that is being made, an index of individualism and it's being measured and by individualism we all understand the same thing people pursuing their own goals and that's being you know accepted and even encouraged by society it's not being you know hindered in any way or mostly and if you take a look at that it's also strongly correlated to the index of uh, global innovation and economic freedom at the same time so um this thing these things go hand in hand to conclude if I could uh, just uh, say a few words um, about Chile, which, you know, experience, we all know, a very um, prosperous time over the last four decades. But we have um, always had this problem, and I believe in the rest of Latin America is the same. People are afraid of not conforming to the norm, of thinking for themselves, 
many times uh, because that sets you apart of the herd. And so it's not a very uh, strong culture in terms of the individual. We are more a type of uh, mm, collectivist culture where what the group says is more important than your own thinking. And so we need in order for for innovation to prosper also this courage. We need courage, people who are willing to risk to, to you know, um, to take the cost of challenging uh, opinion, the majority opinion, and live with this, uh, and it's not easy. And of course, we need to change the culture so that more people are willing to think for themselves. I think one of the uh, great uh, periods of innovation, or at least, uh, yeah, intellectual uh, flourishing was the Renaissance. And we all know Erasmus of Rotterdam, who wrote is in praise of folly. And basically, he was saying just that. If you want to um, uh, really move forward, you cannot be afraid of what other people think so much. And uh, it's the same that Abraham Maslow said when he was thinking about or writing about uh, creative personalities. And it is what Kant said in his writings on the Enlightenment, when he said, you have to have the courage uh, to think for yourself and to act according to your own conclusions. And uh, we can criticize Kant for other reasons, Yaron, but I think he was right on that, um, on that uh, point. And if we don't change that, I fear that in Latin America, we will uh, be in the same position we are right now in the next uh, 50 years or maybe even the next 100 years. Uh, so cultural change is the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Axel. This is already shaping to be a really delightful panel. You're all linking together the things that you are saying. And now we're again going to get Deirdre McCloskey, la profesora Deirdre McCloskey eh, toca ahora. And I'm wearing my Adam Smith tie because I know what she likes doing whenever someone says Adam Smith. That's why I, I decided to wear this one. Uh, That, that that's exactly right, Idra. So the floor is yours, uh, and please, we are all eager to listen to what you have to say. Yeah, on this panel with my old friends, um, and and my my courageous friends, I have a comfortable position in the United States, although I do fear for the future of the United States if Trump is reelected. Um, but you others uh, are, are uh, pioneers in a way that I am I am not. I'm simply a, a theorist. I, 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 of course, agree with my colleagues on virtually everything. There too. We're, we're sworn, all of us, to the truth. And in that, on that theme, I would like to quarrel slightly with the two previous speakers in their emphasis on the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, strictly speaking, was, was an elite occupation. And although it's very nice, and, and certainly the Scottish Enlightenment is my great enthusiasm. Um, I think the emphasis on, uh, uh, on reason had its, uh, its downside. This is a point that Hayek makes. He speaks of the, uh, of the liberty side of the Enlightenment, which is liberalism, and the reason side of the Enlightenment, which tends to um, top down social planning to what he called constructivism. So I, I, I'd be more, I mean, my dear friend, Joe Mokir, an economic historian like me, speaks of the, the, the industrial enlightenment and, and speaks of science and so on. But it's not science and um, enlightenment. After all, great uh, 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 tyrants, like the Empress Catherine in Russia, were enlightened. Uh, it's 
it's liberalism that's the key. And I think we all basically agree with this. It's the idea that we should have a society with no slaves, not wives, slaves to husbands, not poor people, slaves to their, their, their masters. In the 1880s in Montana, a somewhat, I must say, a somewhat naive European was traveling and he asked a free man there who his master was. The idea being that everyone should have a master. And the man said, he ain't been born yet. And that attitude, that ideology, is what I would call liberalism. And the other name that, that one can think of for, for liberalism, this, this entirely new idea in the 18th century, born in Northwestern uh, uh, um, Europe, in Holland and England and, and, and Scotland is adultism. All the other political philosophies you can think of, the, um, the, the conservatives, the conservative who thinks of poor people as bad and therefore people who should be governed from above or the, or the person of the left uh, the socialist who thinks that poor people are sad, bad or sad, um, and therefore should be governed from above. We liberals don't think they should be governed from above. They should self-govern, self, Emmanuel Kant spoke of autonomy, self-rule. And a, a society of adults, of free adults, is one that all of us here, I think, uh, uh, agree, is the, the one that suits humans. At least it suits the hunter-gatherer inheritance of all of us. We all... Um, uh, for hundreds of thousands of years, we Homo sapiens and our ancestors before that were hunter-gatherers. And a hunter-gatherer group is not a tribe. It's not hundreds of people under a chief. It's, it's, it, it's naturally egalitarian, as we can see in the few examples of hunter-gatherer societies that... that, that, that um, um, survive. It's agriculture that that glorious invention of um, domestic animals and domesticated plants that, that is, is so important in, in human history that makes for hierarchy and makes for ma masters and um, uh, uh, ma masters and and uh, 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 um, slaves, and I'm very struck by what Axel says about the 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 crucial importance of, of avoiding envy, or taming it. Perhaps would be a better word, because as as he says, we're all envious slightly. But as grown-ups, we try to control our envy. There's a, there's a sonnet of Shakespeare that talks of this. He says, oh, I'd like some man's figure and some man's intelligence and some man's this, some man's that. And since, since the sonnets were, were love poems, he ends by saying, but then I think on thee, <laughs> and all this envy that I have goes away. What we need to do is to think on other. We, we, we need to think ourselves away from envy. And here I would emphasize ideology as our friends and enemies, the, the people of the left call it. 
Um, you could call it ethics. You could call it rhetoric. And I want to avoid the word that both of my colleagues so far have used, culture. The problem with the word culture is that it's, it, it suggests something that can't be changed. The, the Germans have a culture, and the, whereas the Latin Americans have another culture, and my God, it's hopeless. But after all, even German culture is not something permanent and can change. Whereas when you think of ideology or even ethics, and certainly when you use the word, use the word rhetoric in which I always stutter, which is very irritating, um, it can change on a dime, we say in English. It can change very fast. Uh, after all, um, uh, Germany fell into this 12 years of a radical change in ideology um, and rhetoric, but then after the war has become a most satisfactory liberal, I also stutter in that word, democracy. And here, here I'll end. What we need is not more of us theorists and preachers, although I and admire my colleagues who do this, and I, I don't mind that I do it either, but what we need, that's my alarm going off, well, what we need is that the artists and the journalists, the, the filmmakers, the rock musicians, the uh, um, makers of advertising images and so forth, those are the, that's where most people get their ideologies, uh, if not at their at their at their mother's knee, which, by the way, is another point. Western political philosophy since Machiavelli has posited a grown male adult as the actor in politics. When it's when when and and women don't forget that we were all once ch children, so education and um, is important too. But if we could persuade the filmmakers to stop portraying innovism, as I call it, as evil, we could leash control envy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deidre. So many interesting points that I hope that we can go back to. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention, because I remember that you always recommend Joy and the Founder when you're speaking about movies yes. that look at it in a different way. So yeah. I, I hope that we get to go back to that. Uh, we will now go to Johan Norberg. Ahora viene Johan Norberg. Johan, the floor is yours uh, to share your thoughts. disrespect to other panels that I've been involved with, but boy, am I honored to be on this panel with uh, <laughs> such sources of, of inspiration that I have uh, listened to right now. It, it's I, I begin to think, so what can I add? I feel a little bit like when I made that stupid mistake several years ago of going into a gym in, <laughs> to do some exercise in a hotel in Iceland, Reykjavik. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I began to do some simple exercises. And then I noticed that next to me was Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and I thought, so what can I do that he hasn't already done, <laughs> that he's not capable of? Uh, so let's see what I can um, come up with. I, I think what, what, what I perhaps can do is to try to tie this into a little bit more of the political discussion right now and to um, exploit the element of surprise, which I think is what makes liberalism superior when we talk about innovation. Because nowadays, uh, we don't really want to sell innovation. Uh, we used to, but now everybody loves innovation. Even progressives and conservatives who used to blame it for undermining traditions or trade unions. And one reason is the ongoing geopolitical rivalry with China. 
there is this new tug of war or a cold tug of war with China over the science, technologies and business models of the future, who is going to own it. And um, both the left and the right then says, at least when I listen to them in Western Europe and in the United States, that we need innovation, but it is too important to leave it to the market. We need even more innovation and technological progress than individuals and businesses would spontaneously deliver. And therefore, suddenly it's all the rage with industrial policy, moonshots, uh, mission-oriented funding. The idea seems to be to to beat China, whatever that means, we have to imitate its industrial policy and mission-oriented innovation. And to me, this seems like they don't understand the labyrinthine nature of innovation. Because if you find the next innovations, you'd already have it. You would already have thought of it. And then it's already there. What makes innovative technologies and forms of organization so revolutionary is that they add something new, something truly new that we didn't possess before, something unexpected, unpredictable. And what I'm trying to do in, in my new book, um, Open the Story of Human Progress, now translated into Spanish as Abierto by Diego Sanchez de la Cruz, uh, is that I'm trying to explain that innovation does not come from smart people, from or plans at the um, um, uh, from the blueprints. It comes from experiments, trial and error, feedback, pushback, adaptation, and new experiments, new trial and error, new feedback, and lots of failures, and a few great triumphs that change the world. And this takes a lot of people, and it takes a lot of time. And that's why innovation. Everybody talks about how they love innovation. Every truly innovative thing faces resistance from most elites and from most people who find the new idea worthless or impossible or dangerous because it it will kill their jobs so when you study technology history uh, you find that most people they don't like all the things that we now think are the greatest triumphs of their era. Most people, um, to, to misquote um, Blackadder, most people wouldn't recognize and appreciate innovation, even if it painted itself purple and danced naked on a grand piano singing, happy innovation is here again. And let me just give one trivial example, precisely because it is trivial. In the 1750s, a wool merchant, Jonas Hanway, was the first man to take the umbrella to the rainy streets of London. And you would think that they'd erect monuments in honor of the man who, who solved the internal problem of living in London uh, without getting wet. But no, when Hanway protected himself from the rain, he incurred ridicule, People hurled abuse at him. It looked silly. It looked feminine. Some even accused him of French, which was quite a put down for an Englishman back then. And the angriest people were the coach drivers, the taxi drivers of the day. They pelted Hanway with rubbish, and one even tried to run him over because you know, business was good for horse drawn carriages when it rained. Uh, they had these covered wagons that kept passengers dry. So the umbrella they feared, meant creative destruction. It would take their jobs. But Hanway was a bit of an eccentric, and the umbrella was probably also a pretty decent shield against all that rubbish. So he persisted with this open carry of umbrellas for 30 years. And slowly but steadily, Londoners began to ask themselves why they should be soaking wet when Hanway was nice and dry. And eventually, of course, London became the city of umbrellas. But it took 30 years for the umbrella in London, of all places. Even though it didn't take many tweaks to the basic technology, people resisted it anyway. And the point of this story is that whatever innovation you look at, when you begin to study the history of it, people initially throw rubbish at it. It was a similar thing with everything from the spinning jenny, the steamboat, and the bicycle to 
the credit card, biotechnology, and the internet. They were all once considered worthless or impossible or dangerous. And it takes a very long time to perfect the technology and smooth out the wrinkles so that people really appreciate it. It's valuable in their lives. So the reason why innovations happen in liberal societies and everybody else just imitates what happened there is that liberalism protects the eccentrics as they struggle to adapt their technologies and allow them to try it out for a sufficiently long time that consumers and society at large begin to see the point. All innovations are acquired tastes. And that is why authoritarians can't do it, no matter how hard they try, no matter how smart they are. Just look at basic great innovations like the personal computer that was developed in the 1960s and 1970s in capitalist countries, not in communist countries. Why was that? Why wasn't the PC invented in the Soviet Union? They were pretty good when it came to um, imitating the atomic bomb. The Soviets sure knew about the possibility of a personal computer through industrial espionage and their own researchers because they also had eccentrics in garages. They could do it, but they just didn't see the point. And the Ministry of Radio Technology settled the matter once and for all by declaring there is no future in personal computing. And now we know that they were wrong. But the key question that I think explains why liberalism is superior is, would you really have made another call at that time? Because the general idea at that time, in the 1960s, seems to be seemed to be that the PC was a novel way of sorting library cards. In fact, there was an early US offering for the consumer market in 1969, a kitchen recipe computer in which you could store and read recipes on a monochrome screen. It weighed 100 pounds and it came at a cost of $70,000 in today's uh, dollars. But then it also came with a built-in cutting board so you could deal with all the vegetables and the meat there. I don't know about you, but if I were in the Politburo and heard about this, I'm pretty sure that I would also have said, oh, yet, that's just Western decadence. We should devote all our resources to important stuff like steel and wheat and tractors and, and nuclear bombs. And, you know, even small Americans thought so. As late as 1982, the conservative intellectual uh, William F. Buckley Jr. said, the Pulitzer Prize belongs to the man who reveals what the PC is good for. And even business people thought so. The founder of Digi the Digital Equipment Corporation declared, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. And I dare to say that most of us would have thought exact thing. And that's why the decentralized free markets in open societies are superior. Because there, the few crazies who believed in the PC could continue to experiment even if we thought them crazy and they had a multitude of competing investors they could approach not just one ministry of radio technology and they could also find weird eccentric consumers that no plan really took into account who found uses for it that even the inventors had not foreseen could be a rich man who just thought of it as a status symbol hackers who picked it apart just to see how it worked, or kids who just wanted to play video games. So then came an ongoing process of experiments, of trial and error, of feedback, of adaptations and new experiments that eventually revolutionized our world, even though the majority thought that they were all crazy. So it's not that we are smarter than socialist planners. It's that there are more of us with more freedom to experiment and make mistakes and learn and therefore make progress. Um, and it looks chaotic, it looks weird. Um, Jaron mentioned Silicon Valley. Now we all know that progress came from there, but as late as in, the in 1988, you could read in Harvard Business Review that the US Defense Department, the CIA, the National Security Agency, the National Science Foundation, uh, the White House Science Council, and most major US businesses thought they all agreed that US entrepreneurs were losing out quickly in the global computer market because the US had no overarching plan. It suffered from 
fragmentation, extreme entrepreneurialism, um, and that would not be possible to use to sustain large-scale investment needed. Um, and in, in Harvard Business Review, they actually wrote that only economists moved by the invisible hand fail to apprehend the problem. A conservative politician like Newt Gingrich said that the future of the computing industry belongs to France because they now have a government plan with the, uh, the Minitel system that will now show the way and the US will be left behind in the dust. Now we know that excess entrepreneurialism and what seems like chaos to those who are not involved, to those who want a plan, that's what create, creates progress. Um, and my conclusion is this should really inform present day discussion about uh, industrial policy and this whole idea that we have to become like China to beat China. Well, first of all, industrial policy did not make China rich. Grassroots markets, village enterprises, private businesses and export processing zones did. Everything important happened outside of the plan and it was unexpected to the planners unexpected even to Deng Xiaoping. As Barry Norton recently documented in China's economic policy, industrial policy is new in China. It only appeared in 2010 and it only became really prominent during Xi Jinping. So it did not create China's progress and I think it'll be a terrible failure because authoritarians are open to everything they like, everything they already know that they want, but they're always close to everything they find worthless, impossible, or dangerous. But sooner or later, you'll run out of other people's ideas to imitate. And then that, the worthless, impossible, and dangerous things, that's the only place to find the new ideas. By nature, innovation is a surprise, and surprise that's exactly what anti-liberals do not like. So I worry about China's future, but not about China taking over the world, because the very authoritarianism that makes China seem threatening to us is the same thing that holds it back and puts a limit on its innovation and its ability to take over the world. My conclusion is that in order to beat us, China has to become like us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. And that was a, an entertaining and brilliant exposition as well. Uh, we have 30 minutes ahead of us to, to try and engage in a discussion with the four of you together, which has been taking place in a way because you all have been going back and forth with some of the points that you have mentioned. Uh, I, I'm just going to try to thread a few of them and feel free to join in. I will open your mic so all of you can chip in as you feel like it. Um, I, I'm going to, to, to go to, to Yaron's point uh, on, because I like the example of, of government, government licensing, which I, I guess if someone from government is actually watching this, they might get that idea instead of, of the opposite if they had been listening to Yaron at the very beginning. Um, I, I would also like to, to retake and rewalk Axel's idea on, on, on MB, which was touched upon afterwards. Uh, I could not help uh, forget about Jose Ingenieros in, in Argentina and paraphrasing MB as the most ignoble of the clumsy blights that these fear vulgar characters, uh, this Argentinian writer said in the 19th century. I, I would also like to, to listen more about uh, Dira's uh, idea on, on, on the artists and the journalists and the rock musicians and the advertisers uh, and, and how they shape ideology uh, and, and how uh, something could be done. Uh, and uh, Johan's uh, idea of innovation coming from experiments and trial and error, which I think ties nicely with, with the very start of the discussion and how it has been going. So uh, please uh, feel free to, to, to participate and to engage. Uh, I just uh, put some things on the table, but uh, whatever thread you may want to, to continue, do so. Uh, uh, Yaron, maybe you'd like to start? There you are. Sure. I mean, uh, I, I I really liked Excel's um, Excel's uh, emphasis on envy. I think it really is 
Sadly, a uh, engine that drives the statists uh, and the people who support the statists, and and you see clever politicians using that envy. Uh, you, I, you know, I, I Rand uh, defined envy as uh, hatred of the good for being the good. Uh, <laughs> that is hating people for their virtues, yeah. hating people for their success, hating people for what they've actually achieved. And we're seeing that across the board. Uh, I, you know, I've, um, I was in London uh, a few days ago uh, speaking to a group of high school students, and I mentioned Jeff Bezos' name. I just mentioned his name. And immediately there was uproar in the audience. Uh, Jeff Bezos, according to them, is, a, is the great exploiter, the destroyer. The, the, he has too much wealth all at other people's expense. The world is a zero-sum game is, is the way they see it. Um, and, and what really is driving that is not so much the kids' envy, because I think maybe they're too young to be envious, but it's the envy of the intellectuals who yeah. have taught these kids. It really is intellectuals who drive this envy. And, and to Axel's point, if we're going to get rid of envy as this dominant thread, we need to get rid of the generation of intellectuals who are, who are dominant in Latin America, who are dominant maybe across the world, who are teaching these kids this... Uh, uh, this nonsense. I can't think of many greater beneficiaries of our lives, particularly post, uh, during COVID, than than uh, than Amazon and Jeff Bezos, and and the injustice of of the way they treat him and the way uh, he is viewed by the intellectual elites is just horrific. So, focusing on teaching how these are all uh, win-win relationships and how yeah. much value all of us get from the great entrepreneurs and the great innovators in the world. Uh, you know, showing the, the benefits that each one of these kids gets because of the idea. And, and as Johan said, right, how many people would have invested? How many of us would have invested if Jeff Bezos, if he'd come to us in uh, 1990 something, whatever it was, and said, hey, I want to sell books online. Yeah, yeah. great. And, and you're going to make a lot of money doing that. <laughs> and hey, my dream is to sell everything online. It, it, it was just none of us would have done it. And yet, yeah. uh, so it's, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's defending them against the intellectuals and, and replacing the intellectuals ultimately is, is a big part of our mission. Well, I, I'm right today, actually, today and yesterday, I, I'm, I'm engaged in a short back and forth with a um, Marxoid journalist in England for the magazine Prospect, which I occasionally contribute to. And we each, we each get 300 words to answer each other. And we're now into, I, I have to answer his last absurd, his last absurdity. And he's really vigorously angry about Jeff Bezos. <laughs> uh, and and uh, then he's got these very primitive Marxist um, ideas about surplus value and so forth. So that makes the point that, um, it's it's the attitude towards the entrepreneur as much as the existence of the entrepreneurs themselves. I think that most cultures have, genetically speaking, I suppose, as many potential entrepreneurs as any other culture. Maybe there's some minor genetic variation from one group to another. But what really matters is the attitude as you say, of the opinion leaders. Um, and I, I think the only way to uh, defeat the opinion leaders, uh, uh, the, the statist opinion leaders, is to make fun of them. Um, Alberto Mingardi and I just wrote a short book against Mariana Mazzucato, who's... Um, a fashionable um, uh, in, in, in industrial planner. Um, and she thinks uh, that innovation is not surprising, as, as, as our colleague said, that she, she thinks it's easy. And, that, and, and he's perfectly right that surprise is the whole point of innovation. Uh, uh, if, if it's not surprising, then it's already been invented and it earns the normal return on normal behavior. So anyway, it's the attitude 
of the surrounding society that changes. Thank you, Didra. Axel, I don't know if you want to add something yeah. to that. Yeah, we, we just published your book with Mingardi, did we, here in, in Chile, and it's being yeah. very successful, and the, the Spanish cool. edition. It's so important because it, she has become like the new hero of the left, and we could have a very far-left president being elected in December, so it's it's really a great yeah. contribution, so thank you for that. Yeah. And it, it brings me back to the point of what you said about the rhetoric and ideology, and, and of course, you are absolutely right. I mean, and, and you are with the argument, you know, the intellectuals and the second-hand dealers and all this is so important. We have seen that, I mean, Chile is, again, a laboratory to prove the theory because this country basically has experienced this regression because the public sphere was completely polluted by egalitarianism. We yeah. stopped talking about, uh, you know, wealth creation, entrepreneurship and all these things in the late 90s and we started speaking more and more about equality and redistribution in the 2000s and then at some point it was oh the country is you know so unfair and just uh, it's horrible you have the, you have these wealthy people like Jeff Bezos by the Chilean version who are not going to the moon by by the way but uh, <laughs> You know, but, you know, they hate them. And so um, I think uh, that's a recipe for disaster. But here comes a very crucial point when it comes to envy. There is no uh, way you can get rid or tame envy by destroying the object of envy. Yeah. So, so, so if you try to, let's say, okay, we are going to be much more equal. We are going to introduce punitive progressive taxation and, and you know, wealth taxes and all these things. This is no no way going to reduce the uh, discomfort caused by a society that has embraced envy, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's an illusion, and 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 basically, when you uh, really analyze Marxism and socialism, in a sense, what they were trying to say is, look, we are going to make everyone equal, so we can, uh, you know, get rid of this evil passion that's envy. Yeah. And we can all live in a world of brotherly love, basically. Yeah. Which is nonsense. It's not understanding the root of the problem. It's a very naive approach. <laughs> At the same time, uh, it's a form of rationalized envy uh, because, because you project all this hatred towards people who are better off. And it has yeah. never worked. It never brought, uh, brought social peace in Chile. It's, again, another example. We are uh, much more equal and we are, you know, really uh, punishing people for being successful and people are even angrier than they used to be and yeah. then it comes the and, and this is my final point then it, point then it comes this this problem of guilt which is the other side of the coin because the wealthy the rich people they start apologizing yeah, yeah. and so and so they somehow validate this uh, envious drive of the intellectuals and others and, and they say, let's see, see how these people are apologizing because they are social sinners, because they are successful. And that's the worst thing, because in the end, these very successful people, I mean, the same successful people who are being attacked by envy, by apologizing, made the problem much worse for everyone. And of course, they take their wealth away and they, to, to the US or in Switzerland or whatever. And in the end, the people who suffer most from all this are poor people. Sure. So, so that's the very sad part of the story, and 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 not the intellectuals or politicians who are preaching envy. So, um, I th I think uh, as as Zidri said, it's 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 about it's about the rhetoric. We have to dramatically change that and make people understand that this is not a serious sum game. Otherwise, and, and you know, can I just can, can I just make a, a small yes. point here, which is that envy is insatiable. Hmm. Right. Look, um, we, so, so suppose we equalize all incomes. Well, then some people are more beautiful than others. <laughs> right. Let's see how to solve that. Ah, yes, we'll break their noses and, and scratch their faces. <laughs> some people, you, everyone here is smarter than I am. You all speak more languages than I do. For a, so here, here uh, um, Axel, we'll solve the problem that you're much more intelligent than I am by pounding nails into your head until you forget how to speak English. I mean, that's the, it's, it's hopeless. Whereas we know how to make a country better off economically. We, we, we know how to do it. As we've said, 
but we don't know how to achieve this ultimate equality. Thank you, Lidra. Johan, would you like to add something to, to this discussion or take it someplace yes. else? Well, you know, I, I agree with what you've said. I'm like the gym visitor going to the machine after Clint Eastwood. <laughs> uh, but I, I, could, I would like to add one reason for this underappreciation of, of innovation. I think Axel's point about envy is, is a very good one. And I think it's closely tied to the, the idea that the world is a zero sum game and, and the others are therefore dangerous. But I would add another reason why I think that instinctually we have a fear of certain innovations and why we pelt innovators with rubbish. Because as uh, Deidre pointed out, our prehistory is pretty long. <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. that we lived like this for a very long time. And in our past, you know, most of the time, there, history has many good points, but it was also nasty, brutish and short. So it made mm -hmm. sense to be suspicious about potentially dangerous new things. And yeah, creative eccentrics in your midst who came up with strange new ways of doing things, that was dangerous because innovation is risky. Most of the time it fails. Now we live in a rich, safe society and then we can afford those failures. But people who live on the margins might not be able to afford any risk. So if the tribal lands barely feed you, someone suddenly comes up with a different way of using the seeds and wants to rotate the crops in an unfamiliar pattern, is, is that a good idea? Or should we just chase him out of, of our group because he might might result in us uh, starving, all of us. And even when innovation succeeds, it was impossible for most people to link its use to that particular creative individual. Nowadays, it's also difficult, but uh, obviously, but sometimes we do notice those eccentrics in, in our midst. But say that you just picked up your first finely shaped hand axe, in, in human prehistory. Um, no matter how happy you are about this acquisition, it wouldn't give you an understanding of the, the value of innovative individuals or the, the, that particular Homo erectus that came up yeah. with it, this particular design. More likely it would just reinforce the value of imitating your neighbor and do exactly what he did all the time. And I think we still have that with us. Anyone who comes up with strange new schemes is a bit of a danger to us. And at least we don't really appreciate the value that they create. Yeah, that's true. But, but this is, I, I, this yeah, is the great value of... The next one, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, cultures make a big difference here. Or, or uh, you know, uh, today uh, in Silicon Valley, for example, people have a great appreciation and they don't fear innovation. Uh, in America, over the last 200 years, we've generally, with some exceptions, uh, had a positive attitude towards innovation. Uh, this is where ideas really can change cultures, where education and intellectuals can really, really have an impact. If we live in a healthy society, in, in a sense, you could define civilization to some extent in this sense. A, a civilized place is where innovators are at least respected or provided the room to grow and to, to innovate and to create, and we're, we're not afraid of them. So while certainly history is filled with this fear and, and in a sense, de deterministic uh, suspicion of innovators, we can overcome that fear, and sure. we have. And uh, over the last 200 years, uh, our success is a result of overcoming that fear. And the real question, part of the question is, what does it take? What does it take in terms of people's understanding? What does it take yeah. in terms of the kind of liberal society that we create? What does it take in terms of shaping and changing the culture to make it a pro-growth, pro-innovation, mm -hmm. where people are excited about innovators, where people don't pelt them, people congratulate them and thank them and, and, and experiment themselves with the innovations that people provide. And we see a little bit of that with in, in America with Everybody waiting for the next iPhone or waiting for the next great, you know, thing that Apple comes out with and the excitement of uh, uh, first users and, uh, you know, first adapters. If we could export that attitude, uh, you know, we would go a long way to kind of changing the culture and changing the world. Yeah. Thank you, Yaron. Axel, you were going to say something. Yeah, you know, it's it's very hard to, to defend, for instance, Jeff Bezos, 
going to to space uh when people tell you oh you could have spent that money helping poor people who are starving uh so that's a, an emotional argument we we heard that everywhere it was in latin america it was uh, i mean in the us everywhere and i've been hearing this uh, since i was at university you know all these people doing this uh innovation well maybe you know it turns out that these um uh, missions uh, end up saving the human species like in 500 years or a thousand years who knows who knows uh you know it's uh, it's like having thought about the uh, Wright brothers why would they do that like all the time and energy and money spent there like how you know how uh, wasteful and, and immoral yeah. uh so so that's that's crazy but i wanted to ask you guys a question if garrett allows me yeah, um, sure. Do you think that a government has any role to play at all? I, I don't mean like planning, uh, like about, uh, for instance, uh, or property rights. Of course, government has to secure property rights. We all agree on that. But for instance, Luigi Singales argues that um, you need a safety net so that, um, you know, taking risks and, you know, innovating and doing things like this where you can fail is less costly. So you encourage more people to do that. You think that's a sound argument? Do you do you agree with that? Uh, is there any role that government has to play other than securing property rights and liberties uh, in terms of innovation? Maybe maybe funding like universities who are doing research, which are doing research or things like that. Do you think that is there any role for government to play? Well, but there 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 is the point that that innovation is unpredictable. And there's no reason to think that people in Washington are better at it. You look, thinking historically, our ancestors, I think the ancestors of everyone here, took tremendous chances moving to the new world or, or you know, t taking immense chances. And they didn't have a safety net. But on the other hand, remember, we all have a safety net called the family. So it's a kind of a blindness. It, I have to say, again, it's kind of a male blindness to suppose that the only safety net available is from the state. Thank you, Deidre. Yaron, please. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that... that uh... They are voluntary safety nets, uh, yeah. friends, family, uh, sure. all kinds of other institutions exactly. that can provide safety nets. But I think it's it, if you take an historical perspective, think of the great innovators of the 19th century, how much innovation happened with no government involvement, no exactly. government funding of basic science. Uh, Edison right. didn't get a dime from the government. Uh, uh, and, and of course, I, everybody who came to America was uh, an entrepreneur in a sense. They came yeah. to a place, they didn't know the language, they didn't know anything about the world, yeah. and there was no safety net. I mean, getting going back to Europe was not exactly a safety net, but that you that's, know. and they, they achieved it. So there's a certain mentality of, of being spoiled that today we have to have some basic standard of living in order to innovate. I mean, yeah. really tell that to the kids even today who pick up this stuff. They've learned to program by themselves at age 12 or whatever. And they go to Silicon Valley, and yes, they have their family safety net. They have, but they start from scratch. And they, they, how many founders start companies with the saving accounts or with with friends and family money? So uh, no, I don't think. And and I, I think it's very dangerous too that once the government gets involved in things like basic science and basic research universities and so on, that of course they pervert it and distort it. We're, we're seeing that with. With stem cell research, you see that with the debate about climate change. You see sure. that uh, with with COVID. I mean, think of all the 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 suspicion of science that currently exists around COVID because it became politicized because the government had any role in vaccine development and in what treatment is a good treatment, what treatment is not. As soon as the government gets involved in this these kind of issues, uh, it, it creates more problems than it solves. And you know, imagine. If the government didn't fund university basic research, uh, you know, people like Jeff Bezos, who, who, who really care about science, who love science, who, 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 I mean, a lot of that wealth would be going, I think, into those kind of places. But government crowds it out. So saying all basic research today is funded by government, therefore they have to, hmm. is, 
is a lack of imagination and and yeah. and, and, and uh, I, I'd like to, to, to connect a, another thing that you all mentioned before, and I think uh, Johan was also thinking about it because he mentioned the Clint Eastwood anecdote twice. I mean, Clint Eastwood is one of those filmmakers that I, I guess we all like in, in, in the room, and uh, not only his movies because of, of, of their artistic quality, but also some of uh, most of, of the messages that he tries to convey. Uh, Deirdre, you, you talk when you were talking about culture, you were talking about the artists, and you were talking about uh, the, the musicians and everything. So what do you all think we should be doing on this front? I mean, Yaron, you, you, being in the Ayn Rand Institute, of course, you, you, you agree with that. Ayn Rand loved uh, th those kind of cultural objects and the way that they could convey a message. But I, I, I would like to... To, to listen on, on your thoughts. Maybe, Johan, you, you'd like to start? Well, I think that um, changing culture, changing the cultural atmosphere is both possible, as Deidre pointed out, culture is not something that's fixed. You know, um, Max Weber didn't just talk about uh, the importance of uh, the Protestantism to um, to capitalism. He also had to explain why China and India didn't develop and couldn't modernize. Yeah. So he wrote books about that as well and explained yeah. that, you know, Confucianism, for example, it means it's impossible to build a modern society. Well, now as when China and East Asia has grown rapidly, every, every new modern Max Weber explained, that's because they're Confucians and it's uh, <laughs> uh, in within that belief system. Um, it's, it's easy to create uh, modernity. No, every old belief system um, that has come down through the ages is a mixed bag of so many confusing uh, aspects. So you can emphasize different aspects depending on economic incentives and depending on the cultural atmosphere surrounding you. So it can be changed. And as Jaron uh, said, it has to be changed because um, it's not that the engineers and the um, entrepreneurs are going to do this forever if everybody pelt them with rubbish. If yeah. we can uh, take the, the sense of um, hope and of, for innovation and belief in novelty from Silicon Valley and transfer it to the rest of the, the world, then we would have solved the problem of people going hungry and, and being yeah. poor because then we'd live in another kind of, of society. So that's what we have to do. We have to explain these things. We have to do novel research, uh, but we also have to be secondhand dealers in ideas and uh, yeah. doing uh, documentaries and articles and talk at campuses and... Uh, and try to encourage others to go into advertisements and uh, the movie yeah. industry and other things to 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 talk about. Don't take this civilization for granted because it depends yeah. on what people do and what people think. Well, I was yeah, yeah, yeah. I was speaking this afternoon and uh, yesterday at at uh, at um, um, in, at a, a college, and the indignation when I said that inequality in the world has gone down was palpable. Yeah. They were really annoyed. And of course, it's obvious it's gone down because China and India have improved. Yeah, and, and so I, I think this point about movies and literature and music is, a, is an important point. And I, I think uh, cultures don't change in one direction. It's just that intellectuals yeah. It has to have the feedback mechanism of the artists. And That's you right. see that in European history. You, you know, would there be an enlightenment without the Renaissance? Um, you know, to what extent did the artists and the intellectuals feed off of each other and emphasize the, the ideas that ultimately led to liberalism? And I think that I, I think that what we need today is more artists and musicians and all these things. The, the challenge is that they have to be good. Right. And, and uh, I see a lot of, <laughs> quote, libertarian or whatever artists and, and it's pathetic. Right. So first you, <laughs> you, you have to be a good artist. Yeah, yeah. Then you can infuse it with your ideology. Yeah, and uh, and again, we have to be careful not to centrally plan uh, that aspect of, uh, of cultural change. Let it happen. Our job is to educate as many people as possible with the right ideas yeah. and let those with talent and motivation uh, rise up and and take over Hollywood and the rest of it. But but yes. but they have to be 
good first. Yeah, Yaron, yeah. please remember that you mentioned the importance of failures to progress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Island, there are lots of failures. Even when it comes I'm with to you. I'm with you. Artistry, <laughs> literature. Axel, yeah. you wanted to chip in. No, I agree. I agree with that. But I think that we face a huge challenge because let's say you are a new, a young libertarian filmmaker and you want to make it into Hollywood. Um, so the chance is that they are not going to take you. Like they are not going to, because you have a, such a, um, you know, such a homogeneous groups, uh, yeah. group in terms of the way they think and the, their worldview and their narcissism to some extent. And the, uh, you know, they believe to be morally better than everyone else. And so it's very, it's very hard that they will open doors for you. And, uh, and at the same time, if you are, uh, you are, you are a libertarian or a classical liberal and you want to do a career in that, I mean, uh, you would say, no, you know, I rather don't try it because the uh, barrier for me, the, uh, it's so high, I will probably not make it. Um, yeah. And so you have self a self-selection problem as well of people saying, no, you know, they're never going to take me if I say, you know, uh, the market is good and things like that. I, I start making movies like maybe Clint Eastwood can get away with some things that are very <laughs> you know, much against you know the prevailing uh, worldview in Hollywood. But but most people, need, younger people, wouldn't wouldn't uh, be able to do that. So I don't know how to fix that. The same with universities. Although um, you Axel, you Axel are a counterexample of your own point. <laughs> my, my, because my movies are so good, you, you, you say. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yaron, Axel, Ridra, Johan, we are we are getting to a close. Uh, we still have like four minutes. If you'd like one last minute to leave one final thought, we'll go in alphabetic order. Yaron, your last minute today. Well, I just say yes. It's it's going to be tough, Axel, to get into Hollywood and to do it. But it's something that uh, somebody with the the kind of right kind of ambition and the right kind of talent can achieve. And once somebody breaks through. They set a model for others and, and people start believing that it's possible. Uh, there's also the opportunity today of alternative media. Technology is creating opportunities for artists to get their ideas and to get their product out there into the world in ways that didn't exist in the past. So I'm, I'm more of an optimist when it comes to ability to change the culture. It is a cultural battle. It is an educational battle. And uh, yeah, it's an honor for me to be on a panel with, with so many people working so hard to achieve exactly that kind of cultural change. Axel, one last minute today. Yeah, I want to thank you all for this fascinating conversation. And um, I agree with, uh, with Yaron's point. It's, it's, it's hard, but it's not impossible. We have to uh, imagine that the impossible, you know, it's, it's possible in order to make it, you know, uh, happen. I think that's Max Weber's, uh, at some point he said that or wrote that. Um, and, um, yeah, like, let's have courage. I think that's what we're lacking uh, everywhere. We are only a few exceptions. And I and I uh, I know Yara, Joan, and Didri, we all do what we can. But we, I think we all are not in the majority or anything. But we all know people who could contribute much more to the cause of freedom and the defense of civilization than they are currently doing. And people who even agree with us. It's not like they don't agree with us. And so I would invite uh, people watching this show, especially young people, to be courageous and, and, and you know, uh, and to speak out and defend freedom and, and be uh, rational and, and, and also love passionate, love freedom. Because once you, once you are indifferent to freedom, you, you end up losing it. Deidre, one well, last I would, minute. I would si simply add one sentence to that, which is that, as you say, Axel, it's surprising that we don't get more support from, from the business world. Right. Because it's their ox, as we say in English, that is, that is being gored. So that's all. Johan, one final minute. Yes, thank you so much. This was great fun. Let's do this again sometime. Um, when it comes to the ideas and the, um, the this revival for industrial policy on both the sort of populist nationalist right and on the left, uh, I would just urge everybody to remember Bastia's insight that you, you 
there are things that are seen and there are things that are not seen. The little trick Indeed. that they're always doing, the Mariana Mazzucatos of the world, is that yeah. you know they point to, look, this American state subsidized a biotech cluster and it was a success. Look, we should do this yeah. more. Well, yes, but 49 American states subsidized <laughs> biotech <laughs> clusters to try to make it happen. What, uh, what happened to the other 48? And why aren't you looking into that? So we also have to... Uh, look at the this little trick that they are doing the graveyard yeah. of past industrial policies that they they're not very proud of today do you remember quero the european search engine that the french government and the german government started Jacques chirac the prime minister said that this would give us power over tomorrow and sort of millions of dollars of taxpayer money no you haven't heard of it because it's complete failure look at that graveyard yeah. as well and not just at what they they are trying to show you yeah i want to thank the four of you yaron brook axel kaiser Didro mccluskey johan norway you you have been all deluxe uh speakers uh, today it was a great panel and i think that the audience enjoyed it as well immensely so thank you to the four of you for joining us uh, today uh,